was a Friday night and to be honest I didn't really expect uh, as big an audience as this is a fantastic testament to what we've just gone through and the interest there is in the party. Um, as you know we're here because uh, the three of us, myself, Stuart and Angela are standing for the deputy leadership of the party and the reason I'm standing for the deputy leadership of the party is because I do believe that I have the experience, uh, the ability and the ideas which will enable us to uh, take things forward. And at the centre of it all really is the idea that with now having 82,000 members and that every single one of those members gets the chance to play as much of a part in where we go from here uh, as everyone else. And that's quite easy to say, but it's quite a difficult thing to do. If you think about it, the um, structures we have in the party and the way we conduct ourselves at branch and constituency meetings, I think that's going to have to change if we're going to properly uh, take on board uh, this huge new resource. I was at an event last week where a number of journalists were there and one said to me, is this not a problem for your party? These 50,000 members, if you just come up with any policy and go away and approve a policy. And I said, well, it's a problem that every other political party in Scotland would love to have. 55,000 new members. <laughs> and for those of you who are here, have been involved in the party for a long time, you'll have memories of all the recruitment campaigns we've run over the years. And now, with even having a recruitment campaign, we've got 55,000 uh, new members. I joined the party 30 years ago this month uh, at uh, Freshers' Fair at Dundee uh, University. I just left the, the forces the previous year. And just to give you some of my background, I uh, became involved in the party at university, uh, stood as a candidate for the party, as many of us have done, uh, and was elected in 1996 to put manager council in a by-election, where I won with a huge majority of four votes, <laughs> uh, which is a nerve-wracking experience. And actually, for the next three years, until the next general set of elections, Everybody that came to my subject told me that they were the ones that had won the by election. <laughs> um, it's funny that, it's just like everyone that went to Seville to watch Celtic. Um, so I, I'd won that uh, by election, I became uh, within a year the group leader, and then against all the odds in 1999, we won control of the council. We'd been Labour for uh, decades. And we won control of the council, we ran it for uh, four years, 1999, 2003. Uh, when I was a group leader, and during that time we had the, the Accounts Commission report that reports on uh, how council are doing, we won the best council in Scotland uh, on all the different criteria which they uh, apply to how councils perform. Uh, after that time we were elected in 2007 to the Scottish Parliament, and the seat for which I was elected was the one previously held by George Reid, uh, and of course he retired in 2007. In 2008, uh, uh, well 2007, as soon as I was elected, I was convener of three of the Parliament's committees which were then uh, merged. Mm -hmm. uh, then in 2009 the First Minister asked me if I would be uh, Minister for Schools and Skills, uh, which I did until uh, 2010 when you may remember in that uh, terrible winter of 2010. Uh, the First Minister phoned me as I was doing my Christmas shopping and said he'd like to be Minister for Transport, Infrastructure and Climate Change. <laughs> he said it was actually quite a quiet brief, it was quite easy, um, but you remember the state of the M8 and so on, an absolutely horrendous winter. Uh, I think Stuart Stevenson is then was treated very unfairly, yeah. the idea that he could have controlled the weather. And if you remember how cold it was for how long it stayed cold as well, very difficult conditions to deal with. But I took that on in 2011, uh, increased uh, our majority as many of us did, a fantastic election. And the first minister asked me to uh, be Minister of Housing and Transport. And by this time I'm thinking, this guy doesn't like me much at all. <laughs> <laughs> housing is a huge portfolio that's all right. And transport is, uh, I think, at that level, one of the most demanding uh, portfolios because you're always on call. And of course, right through the winter time, uh, this. Well, actually, it's not just the winter time because if you remember, we had the volcanic ash cloud, we had the very high winds as well. So it is a very demanding uh, portfolio. And before I realised what he'd asked me to do, I said, First Minister, is it okay if I can also do veterans as well? I'd be quite interested in doing that. And he says, yes, you can. <laughs> and then I realised that he'd given two things when I went in, in and when I came back here, I had three things to do. But I really wanted to do the veterans' uh, work. It was a really interesting area of work. And it's perhaps one of the most rewarding aspects of the work I've been able to do uh, in the Scottish Government. We have, for example, now a Scottish Veterans Commissioner first one in the UK. I know the UK government is looking at it and they want to do something similar, but we were the first to do that. This is somebody who um, was for many years in the Navy and has retired and is now an ambassador of a champion for veterans issues across Scotland. We also have the Veterans Fund, which gives money to veterans' causes. 
Uh, and generally, in 2007, there was a report which came out about the health and other services in Scotland available to veterans. It was a pretty damning report. It wasn't a good uh, picture that was painted. And since that time, I think we've done a great deal to show that we are uh, determined to look after our veterans. There are over 400,000 veterans in Scotland, nearly one-tenth of the population, which often surprises people. And of course, to me, politically as well, we have to make a headway with that group if we're going to see independence. Uh, the other part of the brief, though, is a transport, as I mentioned, of large projects, the M74, which was talked about for years uh, by various parties, but again, nothing happened. Um, the fourth crossing, just talking about that through in the other room just now, it's the biggest capital project that we've had in Scotland. It's uh, both on time to be finished by the end of 2016. When we put out to tender, it was to be between 1.75 and 2.25 billion pounds. That was the cost. Uh, the current estimated cost is 1.35 billion pounds, which takes, makes it almost a billion pound less than that top price. And I think that's a lot to do with the project management we have on that project. We also have the Border Jure project, again talked about by the other parties for years. Uh, nothing happened in relation to that. And it's, we're now laying about 1,200 metres of track every day uh, down the borders. <coughs> we also have things like in Aberdeen, the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. It's been talked about for 50 years. And I find that where the government has come in, we've got the worst cuts you can imagine in terms of a capital budget. We're doing all these projects that people have talked about for years, and still we get attacked by the other parties. Why are you not doing this? Why are you not doing that? But I think we've got a very proud record. And the reason why we've invested so much in infrastructure is because we know, especially at a time of recession, the infrastructure projects soak up unemployment. Instead of somebody having to get benefits, they get a wage, they pay taxes. And that's one reason why I think you see the success of John Swinney driving down unemployment in Scotland to well below, nearly 10% below what it is in the rest of the UK. And I can't remember in my time, a time when we have consistently lower unemployment in Scotland than the rest of the UK, and that's got an awful lot to do with uh, what John Swinney's done in terms of the budget. So that's all my experience. I would say some of my plans, uh, if elected as deputy leader for the party, are first of all, I've asked that the uh, business convener of the party, Derek Mackay, looks at the issue of the new members being given the vote for the Westminster selection process. And the reason for that is, if you think about it, you've got this huge energy and enthusiasm of people have joined the party. The worst thing you can do is say to them, this is your first democratic participation in the party and you can't take part. I think it's absolutely essential. And it's also true, I'm sure many of you will know this, that the new members that have come in, have come in are very fixed on 2015 and the Westminster election. They see this as an early chance to have a further say on what's happened in the referendum. And in particular, to see if we can remove a number, a very large number, of Labour and other MPs that really worked against the interests of Scotland during the course of the election campaign. So I think it's very important that we bring the resource and the participation of all 82, 83,000 members in that process. We also have in the party, as you may know, a women's academy which has done great work in terms of bringing uh, women uh, more development opportunities, being able to talk with each other in the party, and it's been a big success. And I think we should do the same for our younger members at Youth Academy. Um, it really is the case, if you look at Stuart um, and, uh, and Angela and Nicola and I all joined around the same time in the 1980s. It was a great period for people coming into the party. I think we have to take the chance now. We'll have more young members than anybody else. We have to make sure they'll be involved in. And also the chance to speak to themselves as well as being part of the wider party. I think it's very important to do that. But the biggest idea, I think, in my plans is to have um, a much improved situation in terms of policy development. And not everybody wants to get involved in policy development, but I think a large number of the new members are very keen to drive policy uh, in the SNP. And what we've had over a number of years is a party which has become extremely good at winning elections, and I would argue very good at government, whether local or national. But what we've not been able to do is to continue with that policy development that we had in the past. National Assembly used to be a big event, lots of interest. And I think what we have to do now with 80,000 plus members is to have regional assemblies, first of all so it's easier for folk to get to, but so that everybody can be involved, and people feel it's their party, they can develop policy within the party. Um, and I think the point is, if you have that 82, 83,000 members, you really have to uh, make sure you get as much of it as possible. Uh, we're at the stage where we've just been through a referendum and we've seen the combined might of the British state basically unmask all the power of the British state being brought to bear against, you know, one independence movement in one part of the UK. And I think what we now have, and I, 
I know the scares the other parties, Richard, is, uh, and there's also 80,000 and rising members, many of you want to be very active. So we have to make sure we have the structures in place. I would also argue that our branch meetings, and I shall do this, are not always the most exciting things to go to. Um, because they have to be necessary, working some of that really Monday and work, you know, whether it's about jumble sales, fundraising, or branch reports at constituencies. And all I would say is that people could be conscious of the fact that most of these people, I think, join the party for political reasons and they want to be involved in politics. If it's possible for us to change the way we do business so that politics is front and centre when we have these meetings. And also if we can be as inclusive and as tolerant as we can be. We're bound to have disagreements. The SNP has always had its disagreements. But with a huge number of new members coming in, you'll hear many different views expressed. And I think it's really important that we have this approach, which we saw in the Yes campaign, which is a fantastic campaign of people being tolerant of each other's differences because we're all united in the same goal trying to achieve independence. So those are the main things which I would like to see changed in terms of how the party operates. I think it's very important that we do that. As I say, I do think I have experience in doing I've worked with, um, for the last two years, my boss has been Nicola Sturgeon, um, who I get extremely well. The best thing about Nicola is that she allows you to get on with the job. There are some times when she has to get involved, obviously, but she just lets you get on with the job. And I've been blessed with people like um, John Swinney, who was my previous boss, Mike Russell, uh, and uh, Fiona Hislop. And uh, Nicola has been uh, excellent, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, whether it's transport or veterans. Uh, I'm allowed to get on and do these things, and she gives people that kind of space in order to develop. But it's been very useful to me to have that experience of working with Nicola uh, for the last uh, two years. Obviously, I've known her for 30 years, but working directly to her has been a real opportunity for me. And I think I could do a good job of working with Nicola if elected as deputy leader. And one reason why I think that's important, and by the way, any one of the three candidates I think can do this job, but I do think there's a, an advantage to be had from working in the Scottish Parliament and also in Edinburgh. And partly that's because you're an excellent leader. I've seen what the demands are like on Alex Salmond in the meantime, the leader of the party, far less uh, First Minister. And those demands can come very quickly, and you need to have somebody there, I think, that you can uh, rely on to take your place if that's necessary. And also, of course, you're right next to uh, uh, party headquarters. I think, again, that's very important. But more than that, politically, I think the message from the SNP has to be what it's always been, that it's about the Scottish Parliament. That's why Nicola and Alec have appointed John Swinney and Linda Fabiani to lead the work in the Smith Commission. We have to always talk about the Scottish Parliament. I have to say, we said this last night and other hustings, I think that uh, Stuart and her MPs do a fantastic job. Stuart was explaining last night at hustings that they had that seven hour debate on um, devolution. Our MPs got to speak for six minutes out of that seven hours. And during the Scottish questions this week, it's just a hate fest. I mean, they just, rant, especially Labour MPs, they rant non stop about the SNP. So I think the MPs that we have do an excellent job in very difficult circumstances and have got the highest regard uh, for them. I think the other thing to say that unites all the candidates is, of course, the idea of independence. I mean, that's why people have joined the party. Um, there's no, uh, well, there may be other reasons in terms of our, our stance, in terms of policy, but independence and the Yes campaign is what brought many of these people into the party. Uh, and we've had that division in the past where sometimes support for the party has exceeded support for independence. Incidentally, when I joined the party in 1984, um, it wasn't really a career choice. We were sitting at 12% in the opinion polls. If you wanted a career, you went next door to the Young Socialist and Labour Party because you would firstly be guaranteed to be offered to be a councillor or even an MP. They had the careers, and it was the people that had a real uh, affinity for the principles of the party, I think, that joined the SNP. And tough as it was uh, for us in the 1980s, if you think about people well before us, um, when it was a, a fringe Thing, a daft thing to be involved in uh, supporting independence. Thanks very much. I mean, the, the, the abuse that they were often taken and a very tough road that they had, I think, is one reason why we have to make sure this is a huge opportunity. 84, 83,000 people now joining the party, a huge resource to take us forward to independence. We have to accept the fact we didn't win the referendum, we have to get the maximum powers of the Smith Commission, but we have to keep our goal of getting independence at the earliest possible opportunity. Thank you very much.